Hello, everyone. My name is Yogi. Um, okay, should I use mic or am I loud enough? Can you hear me there without the mic? Soft? I need to use the mic? All right, wonderful. Okay, let's see if. Hello, one, two, three. Check, check. Okay. Once again, hi, my name is Yogi. Welcome everybody to Kubernetes user group meetup. And uh, just a bit about myself. Today's topic, uh, I just realized I'm sharing the wrong screen on the thing. Yeah, what is the technology? It's okay. One thing. Ta da! Okay. So, people on the call, can you see my screen? I, I'm just going to assume that uh, they see it. All right. Um, my name is Yogi, as in the Yogi Bear. Uh, for the ones who are young, probably you will not recognize it. For the ones who are in my age bracket, probably you would. Who recognizes Yogi Bear? No. You don't? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, well, you'll recognize it once you have kids. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm based here in Singapore and uh, I've actually worked in Singapore for about 20 uh, years. I've worked at uh, Standard Chartered Bank, BlackRock, I've worked at VMware. Uh, Pivotal. I have a couple of colleagues here from my old jobs. And uh, currently, I work with Yukabyte DB. And today, I'm, I want to talk to you about the stateful workloads on Kubernetes. Because uh, most like, mostly, when we actually talk about Kubernetes, it's just stateless applications, right? So let's just dive deeper. Feel free to scan the QR code to get my contact. Uh, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn or GitHub or whatever. Like That should be it. And so, yeah, I mean, this slide deck was prepared with some animations. But today, the, the key challenge that we have is as we move towards more cloud native applications, the stateful applications are more and more becoming a, a roadblock in sort of putting things on cloud native application. The biggest challenge so far that I have seen is in the database uh, side. Uh, and I have worked with quite a few Kubernetes uh, migration projects in the region. So in the beginning, right, you have an app, which is practically just a piece of code that gets comp compiled and gets packaged into a virtual machine or a pod and uh, is run on a like environment. And typically to support this application, you have a set of services that you are using, right? And typically for high availability, you run multiple of these. Yes, everybody's familiar with us. Like there's no new story here, same thing, right? And then we have uh, some sort of compute to go along and Kubernetes is our compute of choice, right? But somehow, uh, what about the supporting services like your messaging, messaging queues, your topics or Kafka's, you know, event streaming servers, all those things, right? They tend to actually remain outside. Get my good angle. <laughs> all right. So um, including like, you know, identity and access management uh, softwares, LDAPs and Active Directories and those kind of things. I don't think anybody is trying to put LDAPs on Kubernetes yet, thank God. Uh, but we can talk about databases a bit in this. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the problem doesn't stop there. What you will always experience as you go along in your journey is everything is actually multi-site. So everything that works in one Kubernetes cluster in one site has to work on the other side. And guess what? How many of you have stretched a Kubernetes cluster across multiple sites? How many of you have provisioned a Kubernetes cluster? Please show of hands. I have giveaways. If you are interactive, I can give you giveaways. All right. That's that's the way that always gets people talking. All right. And one thing you must have realized, I love minions, right? Yeah, I, I just love them. Um, so um, what am I talking really? I'm talking about actually running databases, the stateful part of your applications on Kubernetes. But before even we go to Kubernetes, we have to understand what are the challenges in actually running that, right? So one of the biggest advantage of running something on Kubernetes is you get much better resource utilization. You are able to actually use the same hardware for multiple use cases. You can actually spike things. You can go up and down. Auto scaling. Who else is here? Okay, I think it's gone now. Okay. So through horizontal pod auto scaling, you are able to actually run more things simultaneously, and then spike. Uh, when spike is over, you can go down, right? Um, 
you are able to actually resize your pods, right? To based on like horizontally and vertically, uh, as I mentioned. It also provides you with a very good abstraction for variety of infrastructures, right? These are these are the clear advantages. This is why we've actually been using Kubernetes today, right? Um, and like makes makes your uh, application quite portable. And uh, a lot of what we do today, like Kubernetes is no longer a container orchestrator. It's an infrastructure API today, frankly. Um, you talk about load balancers, you talk about uh, storage, you talk about networks. Kubernetes can pretty much automate a lot of that, right? And moreover, like uh, things like in the, in not in the last meetup, but the meetup before that, I think uh, we had a very good session around uh, Valero, which was highlighting how you can actually leverage Valero to do uh, backups for your applications running on Kubernetes. Even you can actually move applications between uh, Kubernetes clusters through that, but that is talking more towards your files. This we are talking about your transactional data, which is slightly different. So in like utilizing all these things in a stateless application is great, but when it comes to stateful application, the biggest problem that you're gonna have is whenever there's a pod failure, it's super disruptive, right? If your pod is writing something on the local file system and the pod actually gets rescheduled on another worker node, that's it. You're, what about your data? Who's gonna move the data, right? The, it's, it's indefinite, right? So that, and of course, like if the uh, node is oversubscribed, you can actually have pods getting killed because of out of memory issues. So this, especially for a database, it becomes quite problematic. Because here, the database, if you're familiar with the workings of database, it's not just the data getting stored on the disk. There's a lot of things that are kept in memory for the speed caching. So if you're running some queries regularly, um, that data gets cached, right? And if you have a pod that goes away, it's not just the in-memory data, but also the on-disk data that could be impacted, yeah? So that, that is one of, uh, one of the biggest problems of running databases on Kubernetes. There is always a challenge between using the local storage versus a remote storage. Because if you use local storage, uh, you'll get the fastest access to it. And especially when you're running a database, you need disk access to be the fastest so that your queries have the minimal latency for retrieving the data. But the problem is if you store something on the local disk and again, pod gets rescheduled, who will copy that state? It's, it's a challenge. The third one is more to do with exposing the database service out. If you're gonna run something on Kubernetes, obviously you need to make sure that if you are exposing it outside of Kubernetes, you, you have a load balancer in front of it. And putting a load balancer in especially in on-premises data center systems. Uh, how many of you actually run a Kubernetes on-premises? How, how, how good is your load balancer experience? I, I, your smile speaks at all. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a pain, it's a pain, trust me, it is. And you're not alone, we share the, share the. I mean, I think just for that pain, somebody give him a swag. All right, so, also the networking uh, can be quite complex because you have multiple layers. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's on here, is it? Yeah. So okay. also there are multiple layers. Uh, the gentleman in, uh, I don't know what color is that. <laughs> um, so because you have multiple layers of networking across sites becomes quite challenging because if you have to, even today, if you have two Kubernetes cluster, networking between them to be able to resolve between them is quite challenging. You can use Istio, you can use Kong Service Mesh uh, also for doing that. But for a, for a, for something like for something that is very sensitive to latency databases, it may not be adequate. Yeah. So given all these things, right? Given all these challenges, what I am saying is, don't run database on Kubernetes. Run a distributed database on Kubernetes. A distributed database that can actually provide you with um, I mean, that's Yugabyte. I mean, of course, uh, I mentioned I work for Yugabyte. So I've been actually talking to a lot of prospects and customers and partners in the region about this. And uh, I, I mean, I started my cloud native journey with Kubernetes at Pivotal and VMware. And after looking at so many migrations where the database was always 
like either never moved or probably left for later. And that's where I sort of got uh, really tired. Like we are doing migration, we are doing good things, but not with the database. Right? We don't have the same dynamism in database. And hence, I got into Yoruba. So distributed database can solve some of those problems. I'm, I'm going really fast on these slides because yeah, you, you can actually see it in a recording or you can like ask me for the slides later. I want to come to the demo part of it because it's pretty neat. So one of the key highlights of Yugabyte is that it's able to actually give you first same transactional consistency, but in a distributed manner. By far, when you have seen distributed databases, they have not been meant for transactional applications. They have mostly been meant for analytical work. You are able to parallelize the queries and run, run them quickly and things like those, but never for transactional work. Um, uh, sometime in the mid 2010s, we had this whole movement where distributed database with transactional capability sort of got some traction and it, it is like we see more and more products actually coming in the marketplace now. Uh, so Yugabyte actually provides you with two distinct interfaces, a Postgres compatible RDBMS and a Cassandra compatible NoSQL database in a single package. So you can run one set of pods for the entire cluster and you can have both those services coming out of those. Right. So this also helps you in consolidating. If you have a variety of data, IoT data, which is not relational, you can put it in Cassandra side and you have uh, some sort of transactional application payments and things like those. You can put them in RDBMS. Yeah. So that is what it provides you with. And it's able to run on any platform, including GKE. I, the demo that I have, how long do I have? Sorry. Okay. Good. So. Um, what I'm going to show you today is going to be the OSS uh, offering that we have. We have obviously a commercial offering. We have a cloud offering. We have a free for life cloud uh, that you can just go and spin up a cluster on and you can use it for your own applications for fun, right? And uh, everything that you will see here, you can just replicate in your own uh, workstation or laptop using Docker or like, you know, a uh, 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 GCP virtual machine. So in a nutshell, the uh, on Kubernetes, what does Yugabyte look like? So first of all, what we have is we have uh, uh, what we call as a master nodes, which are actually metadata. And I am fighting with the product people to rename this like anything, because the moment you say master with a database, it has a very wrong connotation. We are a masterless database. We don't actually have a master for, for sure. If you've worked with databases, typically you have a master, which is read and write, and then you have its slave or replicas, which is actually read only. In this case, the master is just metadata. All our data actually sits here on the T server, which are peers. You can connect to any one of these pods and you can read and write to them. The distribution of data is taken care by this automatically. Even if one of the pods go down, that's fine because the data that is that was actually stored on that pod is actually replicated somewhere else on the cluster. And you'll be able to still read and write that same data. So I'm going to try this. I know my second demo is a little iffy, but uh, the first one should be OK. So what I want to do is I want to give you an insight that you can just go back and try on your own. All the, uh, all the code that I'm using here is going to be available on my uh, GitHub repo, you can go check it out. Um, okay. Is this visible to everybody here? I know on Zoom people would see it. Is this better? Okay, good. Thank you. Good. All right. So, first thing to actually get started with Yugabyte, you just go to download.yugabyte.com, right? And I'm, I'm just showing this on your native machine. Now you can have the same exact thing. We have instructions for running it on Kubernetes, uh, including like something like Minikube. We even have instructions for running it on GKE. Um, so for example, I'm running on Mac OS. I've already done this steps. I have downloaded this package. I have just like, uh, all I have to do is run this just for this demo, because I'm running a demo application. Um, the demo application setup is, you must have seen this slide in the early part. So 
on my on my machine i'm going to run a demo application that connects to the yugabyte database i'm running three nodes on my machine because i want to try everything on this machine so that you can also try the same thing yes so what i'm going to do is i will just say bin slash and start now what this does for me is that uh, it goes and creates a three node cluster now what does that look like so if i just go to this particular portal which is right now coming up yeah got it so this is actually a fancy new ui we just introduced earlier uh, we had a quite a dated ui but what it actually shows you is what all nodes do you have in your cluster right and their health how how well are they doing and this is all part of the oss package right uh, 29 cores that's because of uh, the hyper threading here but uh, what it also shows you right off the bat is what are your slow queries that are running on this database and you can actually work with work on those these are actually standard queries that are running uh, for the health uh, and live queries now what about an application so i have a very simple application it doesn't have any functionality except for demonstrating the database itself and what it gives you right off the bat is what does your cluster look like especially if it is going to be running in multiple uh, regions or zones it tells you where all which servers are connected in which zone it gives you that out of box what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually run uh, what we call as a um, simulation database which basically runs some simulation so here just what it is doing constantly reading and writing data simultaneously and what you see here is it's able to write about 4000 ish records per second yeah so far so good like any database can do this right now where is the fun the fun is if i go and actually take out one of the nodes okay i take out one take down one of the nodes now immediately you should actually see see did, did you actually see this change one of my node is gone but is my workload still running is my reads and writes still working are they still on they are and are they performant yes we are we are at the same levels in some cases we always experience them to be slightly faster because the way we work is we actually do the data replication synchronously while you are actually uh, running the queries we put the data in multiple nodes multiple availability zones simultaneously even before the transaction is completed and come back that's why if you lose one of the zones you might actually experience the database to be faster yes so this is what yugabyte does for you now this you saw in a, in a simple package running here right what would be interesting we are in a kubernetes user group right and demo gods are not happy with me today so i had some challenges but good thing i recorded the whole thing so yeah everything that you saw just now all the sort of you know resiliency even if a node goes down if it get, comes i i didn't show the coming back up but it, it's exactly the same thing you can actually do this across multiple kubernetes not just one but multiple kubernetes this is the demo setup uh, i i'll be showing the demo but i i want you to just understand this first i'm using the gke's multi cluster service mcs and here what i'm doing is that uh, each one of these pods they store a local copy of the data i can scale the cluster i can scale the entire cluster like i can put two pods here two pods there two pods there to get more performance out of it yes i can like say for example this is giving me 2000 tps right i can actually add more pods to get 4000 8000 10000 depending on what workload it is right but in my setup this like one of the cluster is actually running in singapore second one is running in europe third one is running in us and simultaneously i'm actually writing data to all those places this is a single logical cluster although it's running on multiple kubernetes cluster they are able to actually communicate with each other and keep the replica of the data so unfortunately i'm not able to demonstrate it right now live demo gods are not happy but 
at some point I was smart and I recorded a demo for it. So here, here it is. Um, that's, is it the wrong demo? No. Uh, just give me one second, probably wrong demo file. Yeah, this is the one, yes. So uh, this was the setup that we saw just now. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm actually running this in uh, uh, one GKE in US, one GKE in Europe, and uh, third one in Asia, uh, actually AP South, so uh, Singapore. And uh, the code and everything is available online uh, on, on my GitHub repo, you can go through it. But essentially, this is the money shot probably. Uh, this is the money shot where I am actually running my pods. This is uh, this is Europe, this is uh, Asia, and that one is US. This is the footprint of my database cluster. And I have an app which is running in front of it. Through this app, it's a global application. So I go to the Asia instance, I write things in Asia instance, and I go to the US instance instantly, you will see the transaction reflecting on the other side. Um, unfortunately, like, you know, with human speed, you can't have microsecond kind of, uh, uh change, but you, yeah. So th this is sort of, uh, depicting the, the UI. This is the older UI that I mentioned. Now we have a much nicer UI and very importantly, it shows the, the cluster configuration just now that you saw for the Kubernetes, it's reflecting here. Why we show it here is because we have both capabilities. You are able to run us, run this on Kubernetes as well as virtual machines and on-premises. So there, you may not have this information available from, from the infrastructure standpoint. So that's why we actually provide it to you here. And more importantly, uh, let me just skip over some of it because I have about four minutes left. Um, this is um, the application that I'm actually deploying where I have three instances of this application running in each region connecting to the database nodes locally in that region and not like remote. But when they write the data to the local database nodes, it gets replicated automatically live. And uh, I think the spot where I do this live is here. So uh, this one, if you see, I am in the, I'm in US from the URL you can see. And over here also, I, I specify this, I'm in US. And I go in and I do an insert order. What it will do is it will connect to the API in US, write the data. Um, and if I go to the AP side, it will actually show you the data on AP instantly. So where is the insert operation? Yeah, now. So this I'm putting data in US and like just some random data, right? And the moment I click on save, I will hop over to the EU side and you will see the data immediately there. Hang on, let me, let me, let me pause it, pause, 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 pause. Okay, earlier I inserted the data in the US side and the moment I came here and I did a refresh here, which was like almost sp split second, the data was already there. In this scenario, you can have the entire GKE cluster go down. One entire GKE cluster could go down your application, your database service is still up and running. When the service gets restored, the data would be rehydrated automatically. And that is what a distributed SQL can do for your application. I did not go into the details of how we can even geo partition the data for some advanced use cases. And I plan to do a subsequent session and a working demo on GKE at some point. But uh, that, that is what I wanted to share for today. Um, oops, I clicked on the wrong button. Why do I keep, keep clicking on the stop share? Okay, so let me just, uh, yeah, so I, I did mention like we have three offerings, right? We have a cloud offering. So in this, you have the capability to actually have a fully managed database. So if you're a startup, digital native, you don't wanna be managing your infrastructure, we got you covered, right? You, you can actually go to, and if you are like, if you just wanna try, you can create a free cluster for life here, right? And we have a 100% open source distribution that you can download, try. 
on Kubernetes, virtual machines, bare metal, if you have those, yeah. And uh, yeah, if you want to talk more, yeah, just scan the QR code and book a demo with uh, me or somebody else. Uh, and uh, we will have $20 grab voucher for you. So thank you. I know I, I spoke very fast, but I hope some of it was retainable. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me stop share, remove. Ta -da. Okay, I'm just going to get out of the. Yeah, uh, right. So, can everyone hear me? Uh, those on the Zoom? Yeah, all good. Can you hear me? Which, which one? This one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's one. Can those on the Zoom hear me? If you want to hold. I yeah. think I think I hold. Then maybe yes, no more. problem. No issues. But while you are, uh, you have to present as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So, better. Okay, okay. Uh, so, I can. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Better? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, so can everyone on the Zoom hear me? Okay. Yeah, that's so <laughs> good. I'll okay, put it back when I then myself. Sure. Right, so yeah, can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, how about those on Zoom? Anyone can just give me a. Yeah, it looks like we can hear you, but you can't hear us. Okay. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we're running short time. So my name is Raymond, and I'm from Kong. And today I'll be presenting on maximizing API security and extensibility. So prior to Kong, I was from Red Hat, and uh, I came from HashiCorp as well. So yeah, so these experiences brought me to, to Kong, and hopefully I can uh, you know, share with you all how to maximize API security with Kong Gateway. Okay, so this is the agenda for today, short and sweet. Uh, some introductions on application uh, design trends, and then on how uh, you know API security come into play, and how Kong can be a, can be a solution to help to mitigate um, uh, all these challenges, security challenges in particular. And after that, we move the demo on uh, how we can uh, perform that, and then uh, quick QA. Okay, so I think this trend. Everyone is pretty familiar with, right? So especially with the uh, advent or introduction of Kubernetes, this is the reason why, right? Because microservices are, are becoming the norm, right? We're gradually moving towards a distributed kind of application design. And uh, we are just at the beginning. So with this trend, you know, we are actually seeing a challenge, right? In terms of how APIs are being involved and how services talk to each other. So, it, so we, are, we are seeing that uh, the APIs have evolved, but in terms of API management as a solution, uh, it hasn't, right? And you can see from many different layers, from uh, the protocols, from uh, application types, from the platforms that all these services are being deployed on, right? As we move towards microservices, um, you know, uh, the API management part hasn't been uh, on par, right? To, to deal with the rise of, of these uh, high scale level APIs. So moving, diving deeper into the problem, this is what we are seeing, right? And then all these challenges uh, just comes up. You now, how do we, the question is, how do we manage API security? All, all of these are just a few examples, right? Uh, in terms of security, but beyond security, there are a lot more to management, but today we'll zoom in deeper on uh, the security part. And of course it's imperative to make sure that your APIs are secure, right? especially in the microservices world and in the Kubernetes world. So all of these are just you know, staggering stats to show that 
how important is it to make sure that your API is secure? All right, so diving even deeper, right, on uh, you know, some kind of standards that we are looking at in terms of API security. So I'm not sure if uh, you guys are familiar with OWAPs. So they are just a foundation formed by a group of uh, security experts in the industry. So they actually publish uh, annual reports, right, on, on, on what they see uh, on, on the market and on, um, um, on the market to, to, to share with you on what are the top security trends that you should take note of when uh, we are looking at API security. So in two, two, three, these are the top 10, right? Uh, I won't go too deep into that because uh, the, the, all these uh, different scenarios of all, how, how all these different points can be uh, API security risks are all listed on the website, right? So it, it's, it's actually in detail. Uh, I don't, yeah, okay. I have some, I, 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 I don't have much time. So, yeah, actually, I would like to talk about the three that are listed in bold, but uh, maybe I'll skip it because, uh, because due to the time constraint, but we may come back to it later if we have time. All right. So, yeah, so we have spoken about the challenges, right? So, how do we actually solve and mitigate the problem with, uh, with Kong? So, first of all, Kong itself, uh, as you know, as, as a, the primary use case is that it is a gateway, right? So uh, a gateway is actually, uh, you can see as a proxy, right? To proxy traffic, right? So from external clients or uh, users who are trying to request uh, for certain things in your internal, in, you know, for internal services. So that central uh, management layer is essentially becomes a centralized way of managing security as well. Okay, so centralized management is the key. And then on top of that, we enforce security management uh, protocols or configurations on that layer. Okay, so how do we realize that? It's actually through plugins. So all of this will demonstrate uh, later on how easily we can uh, enforce security via plugins right, on, uh, on Kong itself. And of course, uh, just to reemphasize, uh, you know, plugins are not just limited to security. There are a lot more plugins that are out there that uh, help you to realize a lot more use cases. So things like traffic control, things like monitoring, things like uh, logging, transformation of requests, so on and so forth. Right? We have actually like 1,000 over plugins that are out there. But of course, today in specific, we'll focus on the security plugins. Okay. So also not forgetting about how do we actually enforce all this security at scale. Right. We can enable the plugins, we can enable things like authentication, uh, simple authorization uh, to, to put in security uh, while we are performing at the API level. But how do we actually making to make how do we actually make sure that all these security baselines are enforced at scale? Right. Especially we seen earlier on in terms of microservices, right? How do we make sure that uh, we can enforce all these security at, uh, at scale is uh, by by using automation, right? So uh, Kong itself, we have established a what we call the API ops to help you to automate and enforce all these uh, important security plugins at scale, right? So so as said, so so that we can move uh, along uh, with the, the speed of how the microservices are being deployed. Okay, right. So coming back to the top ten uh, API security risks that we have mentioned earlier on, right? So this is just a little mapping of how we can enforce and the different plugins that we have to fulfill all these different use cases and how to mitigate all these risks. Okay, so as you can see, uh, things like uh, OPA, Open Policy Agent, uh, GWT Authentication, all of these are actually all of the box plugins that we already have. Uh, we will see uh, them later on in action. Uh, how do we activate them? How do we set them up uh, with, with uh, demo later on? But of course, things beyond plugins as well, right? So things like RBAC controls. <laughs> Things like uh, API auth workflow, as I mentioned. Okay, so all these, all these are all these things are also essential, although not directly uh, related to plugin, but just you know different elements of security that uh, we should take note of when we talk about security in general. Okay, so um, of course, before I go to the demo, I would like to talk about the deployment architecture as well because uh, ultimately this is a K a Kubernetes user group. So on Kubernetes itself, uh, you know, this is how you can deploy Kong. Okay, so basically there are two options on Kubernetes. So first of all, uh, you can choose, the difference is 
that one has counts in the post grade database, the other one doesn't. Okay, so Kong itself is pretty much stateless. You can, uh, which means that you can actually express all the configurations in the form of uh, a YAML configuration. Okay, so in that case, uh, everything is condensed into a configuration uh, into a YAML file, which means that uh, every time, you no, know, in time, uh, when when they when they need to back out or when it, when there's a downtime, uh, for Kong. We can easily spin the new one out and then restore back to the original conditions or original uh, setup that you have. So uh, pros and cons of, of the two architectures, which I won't uh, you know, talk too much. Uh, I would, uh, if I'm interested, we can have a discussion on this later on. Okay, so with Postgres, of course, the, the, the benefit is that, uh, uh, you know, the, there is a consistency of the data, right? But uh, you no, know, for Kubernetes side, there is also the ingress controller, right? Which helps you for Kubernetes uh, experts, right? Like some of you here may be more used to configuring uh, the plugins in in a Kubernetes native way. So the ingress controller helps you to do that. Okay, so that's an option for you. So this is optional, but uh, yeah. So this is just two different two different modes that uh, you can deploy Kong on. Okay, so. I have on 12 minutes. All right, so let's go to the demo. That's where uh, the interesting part is, right? Okay, so this is what I'm going to demo. So Kong essentially itself, it's a uh, proxy, right? By uh, like, it's like a middleman, right? Intersecting in between the client and the end service. And then at this particular year, I can enforce uh, security management policies via plugins. So this is the, the idea. And then, uh, of course, I'm going to demonstrate OIDC, which is uh, OpenID Connect, by uh, enabling the plugin. And then, uh, actually, these are the list of the, the plugins that I'm going to demo. I would love to demo more, but uh, subsequently, uh, if you have time, uh, let, let's see how. But uh, the idea will be quite simple. Right? Once you get through the, once you see how we set up the first, uh, first and second demo. Okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So I have Kong already installed. Uh, I've Kong already installed on Kubernetes. Okay, so I've Kong already installed on Kubernetes. So just to quickly show you that they are deploying. Uh, Oops, sorry, dash A. Okay, so I'm actually going with the second option on the right, uh, oh, on, on your right just now, right? So that's where uh, the Kong control plane and data plane are condensed into a single, a single pod running as uh, two containers within the same pod. Okay, so this is uh, without a Postgres database, so you don't see any uh, Postgres here. Okay, so everything is that you configured on Kong is being stored on the ETCD, okay? Okay, so now this is the, the Kong UI. Okay, so as you can see, there are different workspaces where you can segregate all your, uh, if you have different like business units that you want to segregate traffic and monitoring and monitor them separately. So this is, it can, it can be done via workspaces. And then something in particular uh, that is specific for Kubernetes, right? You have this ingress controller workspace. So you've seen the ingress controller earlier on, right? So everything that is managed by a ingress controller, right, will appear under the ingress controller workspace. Okay, so here I, I have very limited things here. Uh, yeah, because uh, for demo purposes, I think uh, I would I would I would uh, show without the I just go with the default workspace, right? Just to mention that uh, FYI that uh, you know everything that is controlled by ingress controller is under is under the ingress uh, controller workspace. So here for demo, I've actually deployed some services, right? A lot of services and then some routes, uh, maybe. So earlier on, uh, you have seen that there is a concept of the route and the service. So, I, so let's quickly walk through that. Okay, so here under services, this essentially this, this is the service and then this is the route you can define in order for Kong to route uh, traffic into the backend service. So 
let me quickly show by show you by creating a new service. So let me show uh, define a demo service, and then I would define a uh, HTTP and right. So this is like a, a public service that you can easily access. Right? Echo it's a simple service. Right? If you want to take a look at what it does, right? It's just Okay, it's just echo back whatever you send to it, right? It's just a simple, simple, simple uh, service that is easily accessible. And then, and that's it. By that, uh, you, you have created a service entity within Kong. Okay, so the next thing is to do is to create a route to route to a particular service. So this, is, this can be done very easily by creating a new route. Okay, maybe you pick the service that you have created called demo. And you can give it a name, demo route. Okay, and then the get method. Optionally, you can, you can set a path, right? Maybe let's set to slash demo. Okay, so that's it. You have created a route. So how do I demonstrate that uh, the, the traffic actually goes through the Kong proxy? So you can easily, so my Kong proxy is running on uh, port 9000, right? So if I want to access the service that I've defined with the route earlier on, I can just go to slash demo, which is the, the, uh, the path, right? So I have accessed the backend service successfully via Kong. So this is as easy as it gets. Okay, so this is the simple concept behind how uh, Kong basically, basically proxy traffic. But the next thing that I want to do is of course to make sure that you know, all this traffic that's coming in via Kong is uh, going through some uh, management, which is uh, in today's topic is security management, right? So I have to make sure that API that is coming in are, is secure. So I can actually enable uh, different plugins to uh, uh, realize that use case. So I think earlier on, so uh, maybe go to, <clears throat> okay, actually I've, I've pre-configured all the endpoints really. Right, so for for uh for demo purposes, so that it's it's quicker. <clears throat> right. So I think the first use case I would demonstrate. I mean, let me go to the OIDC. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at this OIDC OAuth. So this is another route which is pre-configured. And the backend, you know, is is it pointing to the same service. So, in order to activate a plugin, right, it's as simple as going to the route, click on the plugin, and just click new plugin. Okay. So in this case, I have already this enabled, but uh, in in many cases, uh, where depending on what you want to activate, which plugin you want to use, you can just pick and choose essentially. So let's say I'm to enable key authentication. Uh, you can point to the service, the route, and then you can choose whether you want to scope it. To a specific uh, service or route or globally, and then basically just fill the configuration that you need for that particular plugin. Okay, so in this case, I wouldn't go and activate that, I would just use the one that I have already uh, pre configured. So here is just YDC, right? It's the same. Uh, go to plugin, add, uh, add new plugin, pick YDC, uh, open ID connect, and then fill in all the required uh, information that's relevant to your. Uh, IDP, right? So the redirect can happen. So I've uh, pre-configured that. And then let's go ahead and try to access the... Right? The endpoint. I think I have to... I think I have to use uh, incognito. Maybe. So the endpoint defined uh, here... Sorry. This particular route, it's the slash OIDC of zero route. Okay. Of zero. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, maybe I need to show the redirect with uh, incognito. So the host OIDC of zero. All right. So if the plugin is successful, now I've activated, I successfully activated uh, OIDC re redirect, 
to off zero. So that it means that before I can hit my uh, backend service, I have to go through the redirect, right? So this is uh, how easy to set it, set it up actually. So yeah, maybe uh, yeah. Let me get the password. <clears throat> Okay, so this is how easily I can enable uh, OIDC or dedication on a particular route. Okay. Right, so the other one that I want to show you is a sequence management HashiCorp bot. Right, so you can actually uh, set up uh, token keys, right, to authenticate yourself, right, and then that token and key is actually a secret that uh, you have to that has to be handled uh, very carefully. So by offloading that, uh, you know, to to a particular sequence management tool like HashiCorp Bot, right, you can actually achieve that uh, use case. Okay, so in this case, I have uh, I'll use Insonia to show that. So I've also pre-configured another route, right? Called what of his uh his with the plugin enabled. Okay, so by sending the request, okay, let's go without the the token. I won't be able to authenticate because you know it is requesting for a token. Okay, of course, these tokens are not stored within Kong, they are stored within a sequence management tool, which is HashiCorp Bot. Okay, so with this uh, token enabled, I'll be able to hit the backend successfully. All right, just to quickly show you, uh, sorry. Just to quickly show you this, yeah. So within hash, hash code board, the access token is where it's being stuck. Okay. And then the last one is request validata. So request validata is very useful in making sure that yeah, any incoming request, right? Is uh contains the the correct uh URL or property before the request can hit the end service, right? So this is also uh particularly useful in uh, avoiding fraud, right? Because in, in some cases where uh malicious users they may want to add in different funny funny things in the in the in the body right, or the payload, right, to access uh different uh information that they're not supposed to access. So request later it will be very useful for for that particular use case. So let me quickly show you request later as well. I also have a endpoint that has uh, a request validation enabled. Okay. Okay, so with this, I can... Okay, basically, this is the payload that I'm sending, right? So this is the format. Uh, I've actually defined the format, right? Uh, in terms of what kind of payload, uh, you know, uh, is it a string or is it a, a number based on regular expressions predefined in the in the plugin itself? So let's say if I send I send something that uh you know, doesn't fulfill my conditions that I've uh I've I've defined in the plugin. So let's say the zip code is is not a number. Let's say it's ABC for example. When I send the request, you say that the 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 input is invalid, right? So this is how uh request validator works, right? In terms of how uh it can control uh, incoming traffic and making sure that uh, the request is proper before I, I get it, it gets to uh, my backend service, right? And all of this can be easily achieved via plugins, right? As you can see earlier on. Okay, I think that's all I have for today. Yep, and uh, thank you for all your time. Any questions? No questions. <laughs> yep, yep. Hello. Uh, can we use the um the plugins to test the API, the security of the API itself, like um for for authentication testing or um... security? Uh do you, do you mean like plugin to, to test incoming traffic? 
Yeah, because the uh, Kong itself has access, has an network pass to the to the backend service. Yeah. yeah. So can it also send some requests based on what the plugin is configured um, to to check whether the, the API is secure? Yeah, you can actually do that. You can actually uh maybe not out of the box, but you maybe have to define some conditions like let's say like a pen or header or something like that, right? So they can that is doable. I think we have uh we have the functions, functions plugin, which allows you to define conditions. And then also there's also a flexibility of uh, developing a custom plugin to fulfill uh the use cases that you need. So it's as flexible as it gets. Yeah. Questions? Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, sorry, due to time shortage, we will reduce this session a little bit. Okay. Sorry. Um, this is already yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And we have open mic. Yeah. No time. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying uh, today's session. And uh, yeah. Uh, most of you guys, you know me. My name is Ritesh, and uh, I am one of the co-organizer of KTSUG. And uh, yeah, my topic is quite small. It won't take much long, but hardly 10, 15 minutes. It's just uh, on how to manage GCP projects in Google Cloud. Uh, before that, I would like to check uh, the online attendees. Are you able to hear me? Hello. Hello. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, nothing much about me. My name is Ritesh. Uh, I'm KTSUG organizer working as a senior staff engineer. And I have overall 15 years of experience and seven years in multi cloud. Uh, I worked on Azure, AWS, Google Cloud. And yeah, today I'm presenting how to manage projects. So, uh, this is the overview of the topic. And before we go into what is a project, I would like to know how many of you are working on Google Cloud? Okay, fine. And how many of you know what is Google project? Okay. How many of you know AWS organization? How many of you know Azure subscription? Fine. Those who don't know, I'll try my best to explain you what it is. <clears throat> so, yeah. First of all, can you hear me? Because I think I cannot hear myself. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, this is the overview of the topic today. What we are going to do, we are going to talk about the resource hierarchy, permissions, what is the project, and then how to create, manage projects. And I will show you some demo if demo gods are good on me. So what is resource hierarchy is this is the resource hierarchy and this particular thing uh, image is oh, available. This is the website. So if you guys are interested, more details. So basically uh, you have a company under company. So there is something called as organization, which is a top level, uh, uh, top level hierarchy. Under, under organization, there are folders and within folders you have projects. Okay, and within projects, you will have resources. And the reason why we have this uh, multi layer hierarchy is because uh, we are Google Cloud, uh, it's very easy to manage your resources and it's very easy to what you say to logically group your resources under a project and you can manage your permissions as well. Okay, so the root of the hierarchy is organization. Then Folders are nested under organization. 
then projects are nested under folders and resources are nested under projects. Okay. So let's talk something about uh, permissions. Now, when we talk about cloud, all the cloud everywhere, permission security is the most important thing. So in Google Cloud as well, uh, we have permissions. So permission as a, uh, assigned to the resources at the hierarchy, okay? So it could be at an organizational level, it could be at the folder level, and it could also be at the project and resource level. So we have that fine grain policy available. Okay, and the permissions is what define who can have access to what resources and who could modify that resources. And uh, yeah, as usual, permission can be assigned to user groups, services, and accounts. So if you see here how permission works is, for example, let's say there is a user called Bob. And uh, if let's say I gave Bob editor permission on this project A, okay, and at the same time, I gave Bob another uh, permission as viewer, for example, on topic A. So how it works is a single user, if he has multiple permissions, the highest privileged permission will take effect. Okay, that means if I have an editor role, I have a viewer role on one resource, but I have editor role on the project, then I am editor for that resource as well. So that's how permissions are managed. So you have to be very careful when you define permission for any resource within GCP. So uh, make sure it's not too complicated and uh, try to keep it very simplified and I, can I will show you how projects can help in that. So before we move into uh, a brief introduction about organization, as I said, it's a root of the it's a root of the resource hierarchy in Google Cloud, and uh, the same folders are nested. Organization can be managed, billing permission. So yeah, one more thing uh, that within organization, when you have folders within folder, you have project. So the reason why we have folders as one layer is because let's say. Uh, you have HR, marketing or sales division, right? Within HR, then you have recruitment training and uh, let's say onboarding. Then under marketing, you will have uh, uh, digital marketing, offline marketing team, right? So what you do is you create a folder for marketing. Under marketing, you create subfolder. In subfolder, you create the projects for that particular team. And then accordingly, you assign those permissions, okay? So that's where it comes and you can tag a billing as well. So what happens is when you create a project or folder, you give a cost center and that cost center will be assigned. So when bill to a billing and when you get a bill, it would be easier for you to manage and uh, what you can get charge that amount of bill, that particular cost center. So we talked about what is folder. So folders are nested and you can create, move and delete folders. And uh, yeah, there is no downtime when you do that. And uh, you can also add and remove projects from folder. So during, uh, yeah, add and remove project from the folder as well, there is no downtime. Now let's come to project. So again, the projects is a logical container, okay? And in projects, what you do, you create resources, for example, if you want a compute instance, or you want an uh, you want a cloud storage bucket, or you want a VPC cloud, okay. So you will create it in a project, and in that project, what you will do, you will also assign definite uh, certain permissions on that particular resources, okay. Now projects are uh, means you can have any name. So your project can has similar names, multiple similar names, but the project ID has to be unique. And when you create a project, and when you create a project ID, the project ID is unique and Google will assign a 10 digit project ID. So that is also unique. 
So resources, uh, resources are like compute engine, cloud storage, and uh, IRA permissions assigned and monitoring and billing, all those things. So yeah, simple. Now, uh, so when I was working, I'll give you an example. I was working recently on uh, uh, my organization for uh, managing the GCP. So we had like somewhere around 1,200 projects. And out of them, only 100 projects were used. So at that, that is where I got this knowledge from. Okay. So when that happened, it was really difficult for me to understand how to actually uh, get a report. Getting a report itself is a tedious job, but Google made it very easy right now. I believe a couple of months back, they introduced uh, pro uh, Google Project Recommender API. So this Google Project Recommender API, when you enable it, uh, it will uh, scan your entire organization for the project, the projects which are having zero API calls or which do not have any network ingress or egress going on. But uh, yeah, it needs to collect the 30 days of data. So if you enable it today, you have to wait for 30 days for it to collect the exact data and give it to you. Okay. So uh, how to create GCP project? So it's quite simple. You have three options as usual, console, Google Cloud Console. Then you have a command line tool. Command line is just G Cloud project, create my project and your project will be created. Also, you can do it from infrastructure as code, like Terraform. You just have to define the resource block and just run Terraform in it, plan, apply. And there you go, you will have your GCP project created. Manage GCP pro project settings. So if you want to know what settings or what all APIs and where the project is created, then you can, the same thing can be done by console command line. You type project, describe my project. I will show this all in your console. So uh, let's finish the slides first project describe my project and yeah. Uh, so unfortunately managing GCP project from infrastructure to Terraform is only possible if that project is created by Terraform. Okay, by the infrastructure as code Terraform tool. If it is outside of Terraform, you cannot manage it. Then again, how to add user permission to GCP project? It's pretty simple. G Cloud I am roles, add roles editor, user at example.com. Same, you can use Terraform as well. And the thing is, um, mostly we love to use GUI, Google Cloud Console. It's very easy, fast to do. Okay. But uh, yeah, I was also, or I am still in the favor of console. But when you want to do a bulk operation, it's good to go with is the command line, but let's say uh, you want to keep on continue iterating your uh, resources, your projects, everything within an organization, and you don't want to rewrite the code. And that time, uh, ter using Terraform is good. There is something called as project factory. There are modules. If anybody interested for Terraform, you can go look up for uh, Terraform Google module project factory. We are using it in our organization and just by giving one three line of code, we create a project and we create multiple projects. Yeah, you can delete the project. So basically when you delete a project, what happens is first of all, all the resources within the project has to be deleted. There should be no, uh, there should be no resources. If there is a resources, it won't let you delete. And when you delete, it does not delete per se. What it will do, it will shut down your project. So what it does, it shut down your project. And after 30 days, if you do not want that project, then it is completely deleted automatically. But before 30 days, if you change your mind that you don't want, 
you want to revert it, yes, you can go and you can restore the project. But uh, certain APIs and services will be lost. But yeah, you can do that. So I just do you guys. As I told you, there is something called as a recommender API. You have to enable this API. It's not, it's not enabled by default. You need to enable it. And once you enable, it takes uh, around about 30 days to scan entire organism, give you detail about uh, which projects uh, are not being utilized. And then you can safely go and review and delete it. But it's not that simple. You need to then, it will, uh, what it will do is basically if you go here, uh, and you go to IAM admin under manage resources. If you have multiple projects, it will show it here. Okay. And once you enable the unattended recommend, uh, unattended recommender API, this unattended project, which is blank, this will populate. Okay. Here it will show you review and delete. So, whichever and the best part is it will show you carbon emission as well. So if your company is uh, supporting green climate, then that is something. Plus also best part of this recommender API, it gives so minute detail that it will give you information of last 30 days, what percentage of API calls are made and what percentage of egress and ingress calls are made. So you don't need to worry about it. As soon as you see the report, you will delete the project because there is no activity going on and you don't need it. So as I said, uh, if you want to create a project here, you have from the console, create the project or I can go here. Let's say it is project. Sorry, there was an extra S. Okay. Project. See, I told you I wanted to show you demo. I just tested it, but then when we want to show it, the demo gods are not happy. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. It's showing. Can you see? I think you cannot, but let me try to. Okay. So if you see the operation finished successfully, so enabling service, it enables and cloud APIs and the project is created. So now if I go to my organization, I have my project here. Okay, so it's that simple. And once I have this project created, then I can go and I can see my project here. I can go into the project. Once I go into the project, then I can go into the compute and then I can create my VM or I can create a bucket. Oh, so, yeah. Also, one thing in Google uh, GCP for each and every services that is hosted in GCP, you need to enable API. If the API is not enabled, then those services will not work. So if you see this, just go ahead and enable it. I'll go ahead and enable this and then yeah, I can start using.
Oh, enable billing. No, I don't want. <laughs> Sorry, I will not enable the billing. So I'm I'm happy without this. But yeah, in your organization, if you want, you can go ahead and enable the billing. Uh, it's not going to go from your pocket, right? And it will at the cost center. So yeah, now knowledge check. I have three questions. Those are basic, and whoever knows, just raise your hand and give the answer. You will have a swag. So the first is the resource hierarchy is a way of organizing your Google Cloud resources into. Nobody. No. No. We can give only one. So, huh? No. I this was on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's logical groups. Okay. Fine. Folders are a way to organize your dash into logical groups. Right. Give to it. Okay. Who is the second person who said project after that? <laughs> Cancel. Third option. <laughs> okay. That's a building dash are the building blocks of your of your cloud environment. They are the things that you use to run your application and services. It's simple. No hands up. Okay, that guy and that guy, they both gave the answer first. Yeah. Anyway, the first one, no one answered, right? So we still have. <laughs> yeah. That guy. The guy first. Uh, put your hands up. I'm I'm pointing at that guy. That guy. House. <laughs> okay thank you very much and yeah this is my linkedin profile if anybody wants to connect with me please scan the qr code and you will be connected with me and yes anybody has any questions to me no Have you tried uh, managing these resources with um, not with infrastructure cash code, but with Kubernetes? Yeah. Well, like maybe the hmm? so can we manage the resources? Yeah. Where is can we go? Yeah, I'm not aware of that. So you can you can use Kubernetes and other. It's like a project. Manager. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's more like a configuration manager. Uh, that you can. Yeah, definitely that is possible. I haven't done it. So if you want, you can do that. So yeah, it the possibilities are limitless, and whichever uh, tool supports it, you can do it. So yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you.